Well, thank you both, all of you, so much. What an encouragement. What a way to set our hearts before the Lord in preparation for the Lord's table. <clears throat> I invite you, if you would, to please open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians again, if you would. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians. We are going to be spending all of our time, the entirety of it, in chapter 1, verse 10. I'll just read it for you, set the context again, and then we're going to think our way through this together this morning. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. You remember this is Paul putting forth the Thessalonians in ways they were an example to us. And he's continued from verse 9, getting to verse 10, that they're an example of a people that are anticipating and waiting for the second coming of Christ. So let's read it. This example church that they model for us in verse 10. And to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he, that is God, raised from the dead. That is Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He rescued us from the wrath to come. In 2011... A book was written. Many of you may know the name of it. It was called Love Wins. It sent shockwaves across the evangelical world. It was written by a man that is now a established false teacher by the name of Rob Bell. It was kind of his full coming out party to show everybody the fullness of his apostasy from orthodoxy. The book was wildly successful, published multiple times, and really spread like wildfire across evangelicalism. Hundreds of thousands of professing Christians read this book. In fact, he got so famous, he was on some of the most successful and known TV shows there were, interviewing him about his new book. The promotional video for the book Love Wins puts forth essentially what he was trying to dismantle in Christianity. You see, Rob Bell really had one aim in this book. It was an attempt to assault and prove wrong the doctrine of the wrath of God. Rob Bell's question in his promotional video went like this. Listen to this. What kind of God would need to save us from himself? And how could this possibly be good news? I'll say it again. Bell's question that he puts forth and asks the world to consider. What kind of God would need to save us from himself? And how could this ever be good news? For Bell, like so many, they cannot fathom what the Bible teaches so clearly. And that is, they cannot fathom that there is a God so infinitely holy, so repulsed and nauseated by sin, and so gloriously sovereign and eternal, so pure, so undefiled, so spotless, that one sin against him, one, is worthy and fully deserving of an eternal judgment in a conscious torment in a literal hell. A hell lit by fire, fueled by the Lamb. A place where the person is under the unending, unbending, unrelenting, unwavering, unceasing, full fury of the wrath of God against sin. This is what the Bible teaches about the reality of the wrath of God. The wrath of God is the doctrine that teaches us about what God's response is to sin. The place the wrath of God is most contained and fully expressed is in hell. A literal, actual location where people pay for an eternal, conscious, sustained period of time payment under the wrath of God for their sin. 
It's hard to fathom even for a believer at times the doctrine of hell and the wrath of God. And for the unbeliever that rejects the scripture, it's an all-out doctrine they will reject. How could it be that one single sin against perfect holiness is at such a cosmic level and such pure wickedness that it deserves an ever-burning, never-consumed, full, eternal punishment? One sin. This doctrine of the wrath of God, the doctrine of hell, it's really become one that pastors excuse away. It's one that people don't want to talk about. And yet what it really comes down to when people avoid it is they just have far too high a view of man and far too low a view of God's holiness. People have far too long thought lightly about the nature of sin and far, thought far too little about what sin means when it runs into holiness. The wrath of God is a difficult subject, beloved. Beloved. For it declares the sinner guilty without trial because of sin. It sentences a sinner to judgment without their own legal defense for rejecting the gospel. God's courtroom is much different than ours. The teaching of scripture is that God is holy and in his nature he is holy and he's so repulsed by sin in his nature that even eternity in hell is not enough to satisfy the wrath of God for sin from a sinner. However, a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ who's been rescued, rescued from the wrath of God not only rejoices in their res rescue, but we don't relish in the idea of the wrath of God in hell against sin. We don't sit back and think about it lightly. No saved sinner can actually fathom and consider the doctrine of hell without it being a bit unsettling. It's difficult to imagine its significance. It's difficult to imagine its horror. None of us think lightly about this. And does not the nature of the horrors of hell go to the sufficiency of the sacrifice in Christ? We think so much of Jesus when we consider the doctrine of hell because we realize this was the only payment that could satisfy the wrath of God in light of what should have come to all of us, which was an eternal conscious torment in hell. In fact, just consider with me, Cornerstone Bible Church, for a second. Had God's mercy not have shown up to you, had you have not been saved in the glory of the gospel, had God not come and rescued you and brought you his son Jesus Christ and awakened your dead heart and told it to live and you would have died in your sin prior to that moment have you considered what it would be like for you right now hell is the place God's wrath is most expressed and God's wrath in hell it's difficult to think about Let's just think about it for a second, just to prepare our hearts for communion, prepare our hearts for gratitude for the Lord's table. Had God not rescued us, beloved, had we not turned from sin and put our faith in him, and you would have died outside of Christ, you would have been living in a place of conscious torment where your mind would be fully aware that you had rejected the gospel and your mind would be fully aware according to Matthew 24, 26 that there was no longer an opportunity to ever leave. You would be fully aware of eternity and you'd know the gospel had been expired for you. No more offering. Jude 1, 7 tells us it'd be a place of unending eternal fire. There's a never ending fuel to the fire in hell. It never runs out. Jude 1, 7. Matthew 13, 42, it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not only speaking of pain, but anger. There's a hatred for God in hell. This is part of the reason hell is eternal. Because people in hell just keep sinning in their hatred towards God. And they stay under his righteous wrath forever. Hell, it's been said by some that were wrong, has this idea that the doors are locked from the inside. And it's a party in there. And we get to enjoy it. No, 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 no. Hell is a place full of people that hate God, that are staying under his righteous wrath forever and continually paying for sin. Matthew 25, 41. 
had we have died outside of Christ, we would be there waiting for the devil and all of his angels to show up to pay for their sin for all eternity. Matthew 25, 41. It's a place of chains and darkness, 2 Peter 2, 4. Horrible depression and anxiety, there's no relief. Constant. Ezekiel 18, 20. You would be fully aware of the charges against you and you would be aware that you could do nothing about them. Mark 9.48 says the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Worm may even be speaking of maggot there or a grub. Most believe the worm is describing what happens to the conscience in hell. It's constantly plagued, constantly burdened, constantly woven in and out. This plaguing guilt that you could never get rid of. How horrible is guilt? Imagine a place where it never goes away. No common grace left. And then lastly, do you know what makes hell most horrible? What would have been the worst part of hell and what is the worst part of hell for any that go there? It's not that God's presence is absent. It's actually quite the opposite. What makes hell so horrible is that God is there carrying out his judgment against sinners. There's often this idea that we have that heaven is the place where you go to be in God's presence. Hell is the place where you go to be outside of God's presence. But that's not the teaching of scripture. It's quite the opposite. You see, the scripture teaches that God is a God who has attributes, right? These attributes are things that are the very nature of God. God has attributes of love, mercy, patience, kindness. These are attributes that are on full display in heaven. God cannot distinguish himself from his attributes. They emanate from him. Hell is a place where God's attributes of justice, God's attributes of holiness, and anger and wrath against sin are on full display. Hell is horrible for the unbeliever that hates God, not because he's not there, but because he is. Punishing them for their sin. Matthew 10, 28 from Jesus who taught the most about hell of anybody. We know so much that we know about hell because of Jesus. He never shies away from the subject. Do not fear those, Jesus said, who can kill the body here and now, but is unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is he able in the eternal realm to bring destruction, constant suffering of both body and soul in hell. God carrying out the judgment in hell. Now some go to 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 to 10 because it does use this language that, that a person when they're judged for their sin, they're, they're separated from God. What does that mean for them to be separated from God? Well, verse 10 says they're separated in the sense that a believer is not separated. A believer who believes the gospel gets to go into the presence of God and his goodness and his glory and his kindness. An unbeliever is separated from the goodness and kindness and mercy of God and is then put into another realm where God's presence is there of his judgment, of his righteous hatred for sin. You see, we cannot escape the presence of God. This is why David says in Psalm 139, 6 and 7, If I was in heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, hell, Sheol, you are there. There's no escaping God's presence. He cannot separate from his attributes. I know that many of you have been taught this line of thinking, as I said, that I go to heaven and I get to be God and hell is eternal separation from God. But actually, hell is just separation from God's goodness. But hell is actually a very real reality of the presence of God for eternity, but his judgment. R.C. Sproul says this, the problem in hell for the unbeliever will not be separation from God. It will be the presence of God that will torment them. In hell, God will be present in the fullness of his divine wrath. He will not be there to exercise um, just punish, um, excuse me, he will be there to exercise his just punishment of the damned. They will know him as an all-consuming fire. Dr. John Piper says, in hell, God will be terribly present.
we need to understand that even Romans 1.18 says the wrath of God comes from heaven. That is, God's attributes are always with him. God's wrath is never in heaven. God's goodness and holiness and kindness is in heaven. But when he dispenses his wrath, it comes from his attributes, from who he is. From whatever locations yet, he decides to dispense his attributes. And you're saying, okay, pastor, I've heard all that. I don't think I've maybe heard that God is present dispensing and pouring out his wrath upon sinners in hell. I've heard about him in heaven, but I've not thought about him actually bringing punishment in hell. I understand. It's difficult for us to think this way, but we cannot avoid scripture's language. Just look at Revelation 14 really quickly, and I'll show you it from the text so you won't have to wonder. Revelation 14, verse 9, verses through 11 is representative of all unbelievers. And here is what's stunningly difficult to think about, dear ones. Is that whom you have carrying out the judgment is not just God, but you have the Lamb and the holy angels. And it's not just that people are off in the distance. Literally, people are in the presence of the Lamb in the judgment Facing the horrible and horrific consequences for sin. Notice Revelation 14, 9-11. Then another angel, a third one, followed with them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast or the image, so any unbeliever, and receives the mark on his forehead, forehead or on his hand, he here is representative of all lost people in the hell. He will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. There's wrath which is mixed with the full strength of the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone. And then look at who is there. In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb is a theme in Revelation. And you think, well, maybe that's just one moment, Pastor, where the Lamb is there. No, keep reading. Verse 11. And the smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. Presence there. The Greek word literally for be in the face of or before the eyes of, before the sight of. Now I can appreciate all of us sitting back and considering the difficulties of the doctrine of hell and God carrying out his judgment against sinners. But if I could comfort you with this, if you read on in Revelation 19, you find a scene where the saints are there worshiping and singing around the throne as people are paying for their sin. There is a sense where when we have a totally redeemed mind and we see things perfectly from God's perspective and perfect holiness, we can grasp his infinite worthiness, his infinite holiness and sins against him and we can see his justice on display. And there's absolute trust in our God as he carries out his judgment against sinners. Now I asked you all to consider all of that and consider the realities of that. Because when we sit back and consider the doctrine of hell and the torments and the horror of it for eternity, it points, as I said a moment ago, to the sufficiency and the magnificence of the sacrifice of the Son, it also goes to what a grateful people we ought to be that we were, in our text, rescued from the wrath of God. Rescued from the wrath of God. Just consider that again. Rescued from that. So turn back to 1 Thessalonians. One of the reasons, as you're turning back, we have difficulty thinking this through, as I said before, is we are a people prone to think so lightly of sin. But when the blazing, white, hot holiness of God looks upon sin from his holy standpoint, this is the only payment that can come to the sinner if they do not know Christ. When you look in the passage here in 1 Thessalonians 1, 
What you see here is two future realities put in view that we're going to consider as we approach communion. And they're very interesting because they, they put our minds in a place where it's almost like there's two options to consider. And I really want you to think about this with me for a moment. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10, as he's giving these believers as an example of waiting for the Lord, I want you to know there's really two realities in view. Look at the text closely. The beginning of chapter 1 verse 10, it says there are those that are waiting for the sun. Waiting for the sun from what location? From heaven. There is one group, we'll say one option of people, they're waiting for the sun. Who's going to come from heaven. That's the believers in Thessalonica. That's you and I here today as we prepare for communion. We're waiting for the Son. That's the second coming of Christ when he returns. So this text puts us now in what, what we call the topics of eschatology, the end times. We're waiting for the Son. That's option one. But there's another future reality in this text. There's not only some that are waiting for the Son... But notice the wrath here of God is not the wrath now, but the wrath to come. Notice it. He raised us from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescued us from the wrath to come. There's also a future wrath waiting for those people that do not trust in Jesus. So really you have two waitings here. You've got those waiting for the sun, and you've got those waiting for the wrath. People waiting for the wrath may not realize they're waiting for the wrath, but the wrath's waiting for them. So in this text, we have two future realities. I'm just going to call them two options here today. Option one, you can wait for the sun. That's the believer. Option two, if you're an unbeliever, you're waiting for the wrath. You're either waiting for the sun or you're waiting for the wrath. Option one is point one of our sermon we'll see in a moment. You're waiting for the sun. Option two, you're waiting for the wrath. Now I need to say something about that. When the wrath comes to the person that decides to not choose the son in Jesus, it doesn't mean you won't still meet Jesus. You see, the person that's waiting for the wrath is still going to meet Jesus, but they won't meet him as the suffering servant and their savior. The one that's waiting for the wrath will meet the Jesus that Revelation puts before us, six and seven, Revelation 6, 16 and 17. And that Jesus comes as the one who is the wrath of the Lamb. The person that's waiting for the wrath is waiting for Jesus to come in his wrath and anger against sin. And how will he show up? Revelation 19. Eyes as flames of fire. His clothing with his robe dipped in blood. And his name will be called the word of God. There will be a sharp sword coming from his mouth to strike down the nations. He will rule with a rod of iron. He will tread people in the winepress of the fierce wrath of his father. And on his robe and on his thigh, his name will be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, there's no neutral ground. You'll meet Jesus either way. You either meet him in the wrath of the Lamb or you meet him as your Savior and Lord. It's not like everyone in here today is in one of three groups. You got the people that are waiting for the Son in salvation, the people waiting for the, the, the wrath, the really bad people, then there's this morally neutral category of those that are just kind of trying to make their way. Kind of the good people. No. Everyone. Everyone in this room will meet the Lamb. You will meet Him as your Savior if you're looking towards His coming and your Lord as one rescued from the wrath or you'll meet Him with a sword coming out of His mouth to bring judgment and send you under his wrath for eternity. Everyone in here meets the son. And listen. Every single sin ever committed will be paid for. Either you will pay for your sin. In eternity in hell. Or Jesus will pay for your sin. Every sin gets paid for. Because God is holy there cannot be a single sin not paid for. So either it gets paid for by the son or paid for by you. That's it. There's only two options. Salvation or judgment. There's not three choices. So as we consider this text and we consider this meditation, option one is you wait for the sun. That's what I want you all to be. 
Option two is you wait for the wrath. You will face one or the other. So option one, let's look at it. To wait for the sun. Look at the text, what it says there. These believers and us as believers, we are waiting for the sun and where is he coming from? But from heaven. We are a people who are looking forward to our Messiah's return. But what does it mean to wait? Does it mean we wait like we're waiting in line at the store? Like we're waiting at the grocery store line? No, waiting is not passive. It's not casually waiting to pass the time. Waiting here is a joyful and anxious anticipation. Now think about that. To wait for the son as a believer, you're joyfully and anxiously anticipating his return. These believers were, we could say it this way, on the edge of their seats, anticipating their Messiah. To see the return of the son when he comes down from heaven. And notice, this is important, which distinguishes someone that's waiting for the son. If you're in option one, you're waiting for him because you know where he's at. You believe the gospel. You believe the resurrection. And you believe that he is the Lord sitting next to the Father at the right hand. Notice the text. I'm waiting for the Son from heaven. The Son who was raised from the dead. That's right. Not only is he Savior, but he's Lord. He conquered death. And who is that? Look at the text. That is Jesus. Now just think about this for a second. These believers, it's AD 50 that are receiving this. They would have not had all the information we have and all the passages that we have went to later on in the New Testament. But they would have known from the teaching of Christ. They would have known from the teaching of the apostles. And they would have known from the illustrations of men like Stephen in the book of Acts. That their savior was not a dead savior. He was alive. He's not in the ground and he's not even on earth. He is sitting at the right hand of the father ruling and reigning. You remember Stephen when he's being executed and he's about to die at the stones of godless men. He looks up in heaven, Acts 8, and it says he sees the glory of Jesus standing at the right hand of God. These believers knew where Jesus was. They trusted that he'd come back and that he was their Lord on the throne and they were anticipating, anxiously awaiting his return. Ephesians 1.20 says that God brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead that he would seat him at the right hand in the heavenly places. This means that someone that's waiting for the son is not just sitting back and thinking small thoughts of Jesus. He's not just thinking this humanitarian or nice guy Jesus. No, this is the Lord of heaven and earth sitting next to the Father at his right hand, ruling and reigning over heaven and earth. And that person who's waiting for the Son lives in light of that reality that that is not just my Savior, he's my Lord. He rules and reigns and I must live for him as I wait for him. We think about him. We live for him. We devote our lives to him because we know where he's at and we know he's coming. What is it then, dear ones, that um, drives that level of thoughtfulness about Jesus in heaven? What is it that we might say the soil that needs to be tilled up in the heart that makes a person incredibly grateful and thoughtful about the son who's in heaven and waiting for his return. What is it that happens in the heart that makes a believer anxiously on the edge of their seat looking every day saying, come Lord Jesus, I want you to return. I love you so much. What is it in the heart that happens that makes a person that anticipatory of the son's return? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's a gratitude for understanding your rescue. Look at the rest of the text. The son who's at the right hand, that is Jesus who's in heaven. Here's how he's described. And these believers believe this. He rescues us from the wrath to come. Don't look at that word rescue and think escape. Don't think about it was some type of operation where you had some part in it. Where, where it was like a prison break and you worked your way out and you did all this good work and you escaped. And in the middle of that, someone met you in this rescue and then you were pulled out into this, this safety. No. Rescue there is language of divine intervention. 
God came and moved and rescued you, listen, from himself. The people that await the Son, the people that are so grateful for the Son, they're anxious to meet him because they realize that God, through the Son, reached in and rescued them, not just from a bad life. You didn't just get rescued from bad circumstances. You didn't get just rescued from a bad past. You didn't just get rescued from uh, difficult relationships. You didn't just get rescued from having some discomfort and a bad couple weeks. You got rescued from an eternal conscious torment under the sovereign raging wrath of God against sin. That's what you got rescued from. And it was a rescue. God came and moved on your heart and awakened your dead heart and awakened you to your need and then he showed you here's how I will save you from my wrath here's how I will save you from myself look back in the text the one I raised from the dead Jesus this is not a small thing to think about being rescued from the wrath of God Romans 1 18 the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness who men who suppress the truth. All of us were truth suppressors. All of us were rejectors of truth before God saved us. We were worthy of wrath. Romans 2.5 you were stubborn and unrepentant. And in your stubbornness and unrepentance, you were storing, listen to this language, storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath. And the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You know what that was? Before God rescued you, you were accruing and accruing and accruing and your account was filling up and all that was in your account was more wrath that was going to come upon you. This is not a small thing to be rescued from wrath. Not only that, Ephesians 2.3 says that by nature we were children of wrath. People that wait anxiously for the sun are people that realize God intervened through his son and while wrath was hanging over them, they saw that God offered them a payment in his son, in the death of his son, as the perfect payment on the cross to rescue them from the hell they deserved and then they put their faith in the son, God rescued them from his righteous wrath and listen, they did not get what they deserve. You deserve hell. I deserve hell. It would be just, it would have been absolutely fair if you and I would have been in hell yesterday paying for sin forever. Totally fair. Because of our sin against a holy God. And yet you were rescued from wrath. Every sin, past, present, and future, paid for on the cross by Jesus. When Rob Bell posed the question, what kind of God would need us to save him from himself and how could that be good news? The answer is this to him. What kind of God would do that? A merciful God. The answer to that is a loving God. The answer to that is a kind, patient God. Because think about it. God saves us from himself, by himself, as the only one that could offer the payment through himself, from his son, through his son, Jesus Christ. God, in his mercy, not only holds wrath over us, but then offers us the payment for all of that wrath to be absorbed on his son on the cross. Complete, full, final payment on the cross. Think about that. Rescued from wrath. It's the best news in the world. God saved us through the merciful payment of his son, Jesus Christ. So let's back up then. If that drove these people to be waiting and anticipating and looking for the son and anxious to see him and their hearts were full of this gratitude and worship, God, you rescued me from your wrath. Thank you for your son. His payment was complete. Your wrath was put upon him when it should have been on me. All my sins paid for on the lamb. Now I'm no longer accountable to you for my sin. Jesus has been the payment for my sin in the judgment. Now I'm free. I have Jesus' righteousness credited to me. You see me as your son. My wrath is on him. Your 
your righteousness on me. Your blood was the payment. You rescued me through that. Those people say, now come Lord Jesus. I just want to spend all the time with you. I can. Gratitude filled their heart to wait. So now flip it. A person that's not looking towards the second coming. A person that's not anticipating the second coming. A person that's not longing to see their Savior and be with him face to face must have a deficiency in their understanding of what they were saved from. Because to grasp the fact that you were saved from wrath is to make you an anxious waiter on the Lord. So believer, if you're here today and you're thinking, I don't think enough about the second coming, then you don't think enough about the gospel. I don't think enough about the return of Christ. Then you don't spend enough time thinking about the horrors of hell and where you should have been and what you were rescued from. I don't think enough about the second coming, pastor. Then you don't think about how vile your sin was to God's holiness and how he mercifully moved in and saved you. If you sit here today as a believer, we should be waiting for the second coming out of gratitude that we were saved from that. Saved from what? Saved from whom? God. This is the best news in the world for the believer. Of course we want him to come back. He saved me. Of course I anticipate seeing him again. He rescued me from wrath. A wrath I deserved. Those are the people waiting for the sun. That makes up the majority of our group today. You're waiting for the sun. You've put your faith in Christ. When we go into communion and you take the cup and we take the bread in remembrance of Christ, you remember that you are celebrating the fact that you were rescued from the wrath you deserved by the payment that he made, by the mercy he extended, and you did not deserve it, earn it, merit it. It was all grace. What a savior. That's option one. Those who await the son. They're an, these believers were an example. What's option two? Those that await the wrath. I've already said this, but... There's those who await the sun and those who await the wrath. I have a couple more things I want to say to some people here that may be here that may not be a believer. You may think very little of Christ. You may have some mild understanding of the gospel. You may think hell is unfair. You may think a variety of things. But whether you realize it or not, if you've not put your faith in the sun and received the rescue through his blood, only one thing awaits you. Eternal wrath under the torment of God. There's not a morally neutral person. You understand that? No one is morally neutral. No unbeliever is on solid ground. They're just storing up for themselves greater and greater degrees of wrath. The wrath of God in scripture... As it's described, I had Abe read from Amos chapter 9. You can also see this through Isaiah. The wrath of God in the scriptures connected to what's called the day of wrath, which is called the day of the Lord. The Jews in this church would have known that that coming looming judgment was going to be a full expression of everything you see about God's judgment upon sinners. But when the wrath to come comes, the final one, it'll be an ultimate judgment and then an eternal unending judgment judgment of his wrath. The day of the Lord is coming and when it comes things will be made complete and final and new in the, the best way and sinners will be sent into the judgment who reject him. And listen there is even a time period where people in heaven right now and people in hell don't have yet their glorified bodies but God will open up the tombs and send glorified bodies and he will have bodies fashioned for heaven and bodies fashioned for hell. Like a tsunami wave, if you're not a believer here today, the wrath of God just literally hovers over you. But God's wrath is not capricious. It's not impulsive. It's not like an outburst of anger. Don't think that. God's wrath, before it comes, if you're here today and you're awaiting the wrath, God is patient. Psalm 103, the Lord is merciful and gracious. Listen to this. Slow to wrath. He's not like us. He doesn't have outbursts of anger. 
He's slow to wrath and abounding in steadfast love. But don't forget this. If you don't know Christ today or anyone you don't know, know that doesn't know Christ, Exodus 34, 7, the guilty cannot go unpunished. Every sin will be paid for by Christ or by you. So I just want to say, if anyone is here today and you are awaiting the wrath, Doesn't it seem foolish when you have two options? You can await the Son in salvation, in the rescue, or you can await the wrath. Doesn't it seem reasonable, logical, that I would want to be rescued from this? What logical mind would ever choose wrath over deliverance? But that is just the problem. In our sin-fallen state, we will choose the wrath because of our depravity and rebellion against God. And so if you're here today and you think, I might be under the wrath, you need to pray and ask God to give you eyes to see the gloriousness of Jesus. Because let me tell you God's message to you. Ezekiel 33, 11. God does not sit over hell and relish it with a big smile on his face. It's a, it's a reflection of his judgment and his anger. But Ezekiel 33, 11 says God's heart. Listen to this. Ezekiel says this. Say to them, and so I'll say it to you. As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Listen to this. But rather I would like to see the wicked turn from his ways and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. Repent and put your faith in the Son. And be rescued from the wrath of God. This is the most important message an unbeliever will ever hear in their life. This is the remedy of all problems. An offering in the Son. God takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Can you imagine now if we just stop this scene as we're now preparing for communion? Everyone in here is preparing for a reception. Those in option one, awaiting the sun, your reception will be the angels rejoicing, the heavens opening up, your Savior embracing you, your Father saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You will stand in his holy courtroom and you will be acceptable and pleasing to him on the merits of his Son and you will be ushered in to a joyful eternity where you'll spend all of eternity enjoying your Savior, knowing you were saved from the wrath. That reception awaits those who are awaiting the Son. But those in option two that are awaiting the wrath, you will be laid bare. Philippians 2 says every knee will bow. You may never have bowed while you lived on this earth, but you will bow before the sun. And you will call him Lord. And in that moment, just before he casts you into eternal hell, you will realize I have rejected my Savior. Why would you wait to bow when it's forced upon you and then be fashioned for hell when you could bow now and have the other reception? Only foolishness would compel a person to live that way. So to us believers, we're about to go into communion and I think our hearts are stirred and ready. We were rescued from wrath. I'm going to have the men come forward and I want to say something to those that may not be believers. I discourage you from taking communion. As the men are coming down to bring the cup and the bread, we have to understand something even from the, the authority of this text. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 that if an unbeliever takes communion, they're drinking judgment on themselves. It is not a small thing. Communion is not a flippant thing. For the believer, we are celebrating being rescued from wrath. <laughs> and 1 Corinthians 11 says that we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. <laughs> but for the unbeliever, if you take it in an unworthy manner, you're drinking judgment on your head. Do not take communion if you don't know the Lord Jesus. There's also another reason not to take communion. 1 Corinthians 11 says you can have an unworthy manner if you have un 
reconciled relationships because of your sin or bitterness or a heart of unrepentance over areas you don't want to give up to the Lord. It says examine yourself and take some time to come before the Lord soberly so that your conscience is clean, so that you're remembering him in gratitude with a clean conscience. And so I want to take a moment and give everyone a moment just to pray and then I'm going to pray for us. Because I don't want anyone taken in an unworthy manner. I want us coming prepared with our hearts softened about the, the glorious, joyous reality that we're celebrating the fact that we were saved from wrath through Jesus. And we want to come with a clean conscience and a pure heart before the Lord. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment there in your seat and just pray and confess any sins in your heart. Confess to God any things you've been holding on to and then I'll pray for us and then we'll have the men pass the cup.